Hello and welcome to the England Rugby Podcast with O2 Inside Line. I'm Dylan Hartley and this week I'm joined by Harriet Miller-Mills and Ali Kildun. All right, ladies, we're recording this week after your game against Italy and you've had an off week, a down week, a recovery week, a regeneration week, um, but I know that is not the truth. Uh, what have you been up to, Harriet? Uh, so we um, got back from Italy on Sunday, so we've been in isolation. But so I did some gardening. Well, when I say gardening, de weeding, and literally that that is it. That and watching Sherlock Holmes. I'm a new so, I'm a new pergoer to Sherlock Holmes. So you, you've been at home isolating, but now you're back in camp. Yeah. Yeah. So we're. Is it logistics of it all? Is it like you're allowed um, elite sport? Is it exempt as long as you isolate for? certain days for when you get back so now we're back in camp from today yeah we're not we're not allowed out of quarantine until saturday um so we're all still in the bubble there's no one external who didn't go to it that had come into camp so it's just still the same bubble and then as of saturday um i think afternoon then we're officially out of quarantine but obviously you've got to be careful any, anyway because we were meant to play wales but uh, that game has been called off so now we've got a couple more days at home before hitting the, the next two and a half weeks of big games as well. But ser- like secretly, are you a little bit happy that the training friendly against Wales has been called off? Harriet, you're nodding yes. Yeah. I'm yeah, 30 tomorrow, so I'm like, yeah, sweet. I get, a, I'm all, no, I'm playing for Wasps on Saturday, but I get Sunday off. Hang on, I, I know you're 30 tomorrow. I was about to say happy yes. birthday. What are your plans? You're going home for the weekend. You obviously can't have a big party because of the yeah. bubble and rules. But um, early happy birthday. What have you got planned? Um, nothing. <laughs> um, no, so I'm meeting up with my brother in London on Sunday. We're going to be tourists and just like get Boris bikes, go between Balbon, like Chinatown, get some donut time, coffee, don't go inside anywhere. And don't go on any public transport. Ali, what about you? What, what's the plans for the weekend? Um, not much. I've just moved apartments. So just sort of taking everything to my boyfriend. So we'll probably be just sorting that out. And hopefully a Sunday that I can chill out. I, I think I want a nice Sunday roast because I miss that in camp. I don't quite get a Sunday roast when we're in Italy. I can tell you that. <laughs> Honestly, some of, some of the food when you travel is pretty um, suspect, isn't it? The, on the first night I came in in Italy and uh, I was thinking, oh, I'm really excited for some Italian food, actually. And Meg Jones said, oh, hell, there's meatballs. They're really nice, really nice. And I was like, Bang. went down, didn't even look at what I was getting, got the meatballs, put it in my mouth, didn't even have to bite it. I literally pushed my tongue to the top of my mouth and it just disintegrated. And I was like, everyone, she was looking at me with the girls at the back and I just was looking around because it stitched me up because it was, it was mystery meat. We had no idea what we were eating, but yeah. Hey, you got to be careful on the continent. And if you're like any other northerner I ever played with, you have the palate of a four-year-old and all they have is Sunday roast for every meal, like <laughs> meat and potatoes and lots of gravy. Yeah, lots um, of gravy, yeah. But yeah, I, I agree on the, on the continent. It's, it's dangerous, like France and Italy. It can either be really, really good, like fresh produce, or it can be really, really bad. When Because um, I don't know if you guys do it, but weird hand or our trainers or nutritionists would hand over the menu to the hotel and they would try and whip up what was expected on the, and things like baked beans, as simple as baked beans. We ended up traveling with Heinz baked beans because they would get baked beans wrong. They'd come out with that. What are the white beans? Are they butter beans? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. They'd come out with them with like tin chopped tomato sauce. And you can imagine some boys are so set in what they eat pre-match and that it really messes some of the guys' preparation. Yeah, I can't remember where it was. It was only a few a few months ago or something. We went somewhere and obviously we'd said beans and they thought it was peas. And in the morning there were peas and we were all like, I don't understand why there's peas. And it's because they'd misunderstood beans for peas for breakfast. <laughs> As if peas that's on it. toast. Yeah. Peas on that toast, was- there you go. That was France in autumns, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going back to rugby, we've kind of gone off way over there somewhere about food. I, I could talk about food for the whole pot if you want. But we need, we're here to talk about rugby. After having a bit of time to reflect on your game against Italy, uh, emotionally, how are you feeling? Uh, obviously, you've had time to, to rest this week, recuperate. How are you feeling going into your, your next game, regardless of who it is? How's you and I go first? 
<laughs> Sorry, <laughs> do you know what? I'll start using your names and, and yeah, I'll ask. I don't Sorry. want to start speaking over that song. <laughs> that's not, that's that's Ellie's get out. Oh, has you, you start us off? Yeah, please be my guest. <laughs> um, so I think it, it's exciting because we've built so much on the Scotland game. We started really well and then dwindled off and then finished well and then Italy really came at us so we've got a lot of learning like today mids lovers and I think Scott in the backs was saying that we've um we've all we've basically had the positive second chances so we got a second chance like on line outs to nail it and score off a driving mall and things like that whereas we're not going to get that against France so uh, we basically just need to sort out our set piece and our first phase stuff so it's good because we've got a lot to learn but yet we still we won well, but we've still got loads to learn before France. Ellie, what about you in terms of um, good start against Scotland, slow start against Italy? Would you like to be playing this weekend? Would you like that kind of continuity in a tournament? Or is it a bit harder or more of a challenge to, to have a couple of weeks break before your next big game? I think either way, I don't think it's going to impact it too much. It's similar to what Harriet said. We know that we've come away from the game and personally knowing a lot of like there's a lot of things to work on it is frustrating because even the the score line doesn't always reflect how we feel we've been training and as as a squad we know that there's so much more left in the tank and i think obviously when you when you see on social media you see the score you see a lot of people congratulating but you know that bittersweet feeling when you're like yeah it looked good but it could look so much better because yeah, we scored a lot, but if you actually know rugby and you, you broke it down and then you watched how we've been training, it, we've definitely got a lot to prove in the in the next couple of games. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Um, you, you leave a lot of opportunities out there and you're always chasing the perfect game and, and you always want to improve. And because the scoreline kind of hides a lot of lost opportunity, I suppose. It's good that you, th- you, you think like that, though. Um, you're always trying to push and grow because if you're just happy with that uh, you wouldn't improve as a team you know yeah well Um, if you put the halves if you put the first half of Scotland and the second half of Italy you might have not a perfect game but you're a lot closer to to what we've been playing in the past couple games it's just trying to find a way of having it from minute one uh, I don't even know how many minutes we play because it's different in in Prem not 80 Um, (laughs) they're going to clip that they're going to clip that on I don't even know how many minutes we play (laughs) No, it's confusing. I mean, you could have pushed in scrums at one point, or you know, yeah. up, we have yeah. in, in, in prem. It's music. different in prem. It's different. All the rules are different. So you've kind of got to get used to the switch of playing different rules for either prem or or England. It's only because of COVID. Just uh, yeah, I mean, not because yeah, of COVID. Um, <laughs> you guys obviously um, play play club together at Wasps. Um, Ellie, can you tell me why Harriet's Twitter bio says here to make the world a more awkward place? How well do you know her? Um, I do know Harriet very well. Um, we had a little bit of a conversation before before coming on this, and she kind of said, "Can you take lead and I'll and I'll chip in." I'm much more of a social person than or extroverted person than Harriet. She's quite introverted, um, but it works. It's uh, there's a lot of introverted people in in every club. So, and then you've got the extroverts that are very loud as well. So that's probably what um, what that means. Jeez, I was hoping you were some sort of comedian, Harriet. No, no, I'm just awkward as hell. I'll be the person that says something or like be like, oh, oh, that was a secret. Or um, or just, I don't know, like, I'm just awkward as hell. If you put me in a situation that's like right now, I just feel so uncomfortable. I'm like, ah. God. Okay, do you want me to change the question? Do you want me to move on? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll... yeah, making it awkward now, you see. <laughs> okay. This is why Ellie's not to leave. Right, we're going to move on. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your journeys um, and, and your backgrounds. Um, Ellie, you played rugby league um, like any good northerner. Um, there's obviously some good pedigree that comes from up north and Faz and Forty, for instance. Um, tell me about your, your kind of journey to, to Union. So it kind of happened whilst I was playing league. So I'd started um, when I was six, I think. I was playing out with my neighbours and I only got two sets of neighbours. And they were just leaving to go rugby training and I just tagged along. Um, ended up going down and that was league. 
Um, and then literally the, the Sunday, so this is on the Saturday, I went to lead training. One of the boys then said, oh, I'm going to other training on Sunday. I had no idea what it was about. Went on the Sunday and it was a union and it was actually a game. It wasn't a training session. And I still was passing the ball forward. I didn't know anything to do with rugby. Um, so then for the next, well, four, four or five years at least, I was playing both codes for Saturday being league, Sunday being union, um, and kind of then ended up taking off a little bit with, with union um, rather than league. I think the pathway was a lot more clearer in the union side than the league. Uh, so just ended up going through there and I stopped playing league at um, 13. Um, so once girls can play with boys, I, I kind of stopped. Uh, kind of got bored of only getting the ball on the, six, on the fifth tackle. Um, and that would be a kick, so it'd be it'd be a chance if I got it anyway. Yeah, I was I was going to say it, same same but different. It's, it's there's so many um, things that are alike, but there's a different set of rules effectively. Mm. But did you prefer one? Was there one that um, offered you more space, more time on the ball, more freedom? Mm. And is it credit to the RFU that there was a pathway for for a young girl to to see where she was going with her rugby? Um, I think at that age, I didn't have a preference. It was just picking up the ball and, and running. My mum's recently brought out a few videos or home videos of us playing. Um, and I haven't I haven't ever been able to remember what it was like. And watching it back was quite cool. And I obviously just like picking up the ball and scoring and taking on a few boys. Uh, so I wouldn't be able to say I've got a preference. Um, in terms of the pathway, um, it was a little bit difficult, especially um, up north, because... Training, I had to tra- I had to train somewhere that was about an hour and a half away. And I actually stopped playing rugby for about a year because I didn't know of any clubs. They were so far apart that I didn't know if there was any sort of pathway or anything. Um, and I ended up going, my mum found some county trials for Yorkshire and I just turned up and I hadn't been playing for a club. And they said, oh, what's your club? And I made up a name. I just said I was playing for a certain club. I'd, I'd made it up. I won't be. I mean, you didn't make up a name. It was a club, though. Yeah, it was a club. I knew it was a boys' okay. club in an area. Um, and they're like, "Oh, are you sure you're playing?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'm, I've, I've been playing there, and I haven't played for a year at this point because I couldn't find anywhere." And then I did the did the um, the trial and got in. And then after they said, "By the way, you're gonna have to find a, an actual club." And I was like, oh, okay. And then from then on, I kind of went through the went through the system of under 15s, under 18s at county and divisional. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I got into union and where I, I didn't do under 20s. I missed the under 20s gap because um, I, I came to uh, the senior setup when I was 17, 18. So I kind of did that jump um, from under 18s to seniors. Wow. Mm. You're it's- really good, aren't you? You're just really good. <laughs> I mean, I'd turn, I didn't really know what a meeting was. We were used to being told where to go and having to wait outside of a, of a building to, tell, to be told where to go next. I remember on the first, on the first camp, I was in my room and I was, I was like, where is everyone? <laughs> why, is, why is no one like just waiting outside the rooms or anything? It's because everyone was in a meeting with a notepad, which I didn't know to bring notepads either. So <laughs> a lot of learning, but... Yeah, it was it was a big jump going from under eighteen and being cradled to seniors, where it's people's jobs. I felt like a um. That it's really interesting that you picked up on the notepad thing. Like, I'm old school. Like, I don't see myself as old school, but I've got a notebook and I write things down. Mm-hmm. And by the end of my career, you're in a meeting and you can hear. Tick, 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 tick. What a typewriter? What? Well, no, it's a <laughs> iPad. That was uh. Is that your? Is that humour from you, is it? <laughs> might be. <laughs> okay, might be. All right. Harriet, what about you? Um, Ellie talked about her, her mum finding some clips. If we found clips of you, um, we'll be going to the black and white days. Um, you are approaching 30. You are old. You're closer to me than you are, uh, Ellie. Um, you up in Manchester with your brothers and, and sister, your brother and sister, sorry. Yeah. Um, how did that all start for you? Um, I think my brother's friend was like, come and play rugby. Uh, when he was like eight years old and then I went for about three weeks and my mum used to make my me go with my dad to get me out of the house so she could clean or do whatever she got and whatever she wants to do on a Sunday morning um, and then ap- apparently I just was constantly playing with the ball and making my dad run around with me and then my mum was like well why don't you just get her to join in as well so I joined in for one session with my brother's year 
and then I'm a year younger than my a year older than my brother. So then they just said, oh, she can just go in her own age. Uh, so when I was I was nine. So um, so then yeah, and then played uh, boys rugby till I was twelve um, or under twelves, and then I was similar to Ellie, uh, but there was somebody who had played at Manchester like four years before. Um, that knew of a women's t- team. But then when I, God, this is old now, it used to be under 18s and then there was nothing else. So as a 12-year-old, I was playing with 18-year-olds. So they put me at scrum half. So I was like, okay. Um, so yeah, I played at scrum half and full back and then 13. So I just, but I, every year I had to move clubs because there was no women's rugby in the Northwest. Um, so I was like, what year was it? It was like, um, somewhere in Manchester, then Chester, um, and then at Sandbach, and then it ended up at West Park Leeds. My dad used to drive me miles. I, I remember Amy Kikane actually telling me the same story when she was like 12, 13 in New Zealand. Her only option was to play like women's rugby. Yeah. So at that age, I, I think she was playing front row at the time, but like that's cutting your teeth. Like that's in at the deep end, like not not dipping your toe and you, you're literally diving in, aren't you? So does, does your dad need to take some credit? Um, and your mum, obviously, but it sounds like your mum was at home gardening uh, while no, you guys were up playing, playing rugby. But your, your brother's obviously playing professionally and your sister yeah. Bridget played, or does she still play, sorry? Uh, no, no, no. She stopped playing about four or five years ago now. So she played for Scotland. Yeah. Like your dad must be one heck of a coach or you must have had some great coaches I'm kind of finding the the common ground here. It sounds like it's your dad. Oh no, my dad's my my mum was the main instigator, being like, "Oh, why? Just because she's a girl, she should be able to play rugby." Um, uh, so my mum and dad very much on a weekend were split between driving my brother to games. I tended to have my mum. I got my mum a lot um, as the taxi driver, and my sister. Obviously, we were in the same team. Um, but we had really at Manchester Rugby Club. Um, the coaches like shout out to any of them they were awesome and I never had I he hear stories about girls playing with boys and getting loads of sexist stuff I never had that and I never experienced that until I went to sixth form like the where boys would treat you differently because you're a girl and I can't believe that I I just had never experienced it where like a boy wouldn't pass to you or because I was a girl or anything like that it was just always I was a teammate that was the feeling I got anyway um so and with my I think um Ben Spencer played with my uh brother as well in the team uh, with like the younger team and like even all of his team were just really like I don't know supportive it wasn't that I was a girl I was a rugby player so that's good that's good to hear yeah I think that the foundation from Manchester Rugby Club is what made me like love rugby not in yeah brilliant um so talk to me about your sister right you and her. I've seen your advert. Yeah, oh, no. big time. Um, so you got you playing for England, her playing for Scotland. How did that come about? What? How did her pathway change at some point? Or, and I'd love to know who the family supported that day because I was obviously born in New Zealand. Whenever I played the All Blacks, um, all my family still live in New Zealand. They'd say, "We hope you have a good game," and I'd be like, "Go on," and there'd be nothing more. And we hope the All Blacks win. So in your family, how was that split? And can you quickly tell me the, um, the little bit of background to it. So um, my sister played at a club Waterloo uh, up in uh, the north. And um, she, it was like, I think it was like her friend was like, I'm going to go to Scotland trials. Do you want to come? So she was like, yeah, sure. My, all my mum's family is Scottish. Um, so she went along and got picked and then played for, I think, three seasons. Um, and then on the day, they just were like supporting rugby, but realistically, that's a lie. That's a lie. Every, <laughs> they were supporting every parent, Scotland. They were every supporting parent Scotland. has a favourite. Trust me. And my mum's ringtone is "Far of Scotland," so for all the family members, so I feel like that says everything. Um, and bragging rights that day. Oh yeah. Let's let's take it right back to your first caps. Um, Ellie, you in 2018, Harriet, yours in 2011. Ellie, what are your, your memories from your early days as a Red Rose while it's fresh in the mind? Fresh in the mind, yeah. It wasn't so long ago, was it? No, it wasn't. I'm, I'm 21 now, so it was only a couple of years ago, really. I remember a few things. Firstly, on my first cap, 
when I went over to my parents, oh, no, when I went over to the stands, because I saw everyone going around, a couple of girls handed me the phone and I took a picture of them and gave it back to them. And they were like, no, can we have a selfie? And I was like, oh, oh, we do that. Okay, so that was one of them. And the same same time someone asked for a signature and I hadn't actually got a signature at that point. So I made it up on the spot and then tried to remember it for all the rest of the people that we went down to. Um, and when I finally got to my parents, gave them a hug, obviously was congratulated and then was handed my homework for the, um, for the next week because I was still doing A-levels. So they'd been sent my homework for my biology teacher and they just gave it and then I had to run across the pitch with books in my hand. So I definitely remember that. Um, I remember that because it was quite a few of us coming in, like Jess Breach, um, Zoe Harrison's another one, and how we, we've we played, they're a bit older than I am, but we all knew each other from playing against each other or they were under 18s when I was in the 15s or they were just within, we have this thing called TDG, which is part of the pathway. One other thing is playing against um, France in France. So one of the girls said to me, well, what's the biggest crowd you've ever played in front of Ellie? And I said, oh, well, last weekend when we played against Wales. And they were like, oh, OK. And we went to we went to France and I had uh, some Beats headphones on, the noise cancelling ones. And I, I came out and I was already looking around and I was like, in awe because all I could hear was the 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 crowd. But then when I took my headphones off, you know, in movies when it's like really loud and then you put it back on. It was almost like that. And I we were doing hand signals to try to tell each other the moves. And obviously you guys, the, the men playing in front of huge crowds. I don't know how you do it. If we were, I think there was 24,000 that day. It was a record crowd, wasn't it? Yeah. And that, that was, it was incredible. But I don't know how, you know, football is when it's sold out Wembley. How the heck they, they hear each other? I don't know how you get around anything. But yeah, that's a few things that, that definitely definitely stick out. There's, there's so many things I want to I talk about there. But um, like one, the signature thing, man, there's an expectation if you're a professional sports person, like you need like a good signature. Yeah. I, I just basically found one that I could do really quickly. I don't mm. know about what yours ended up looking like. But um, yeah, uh, <laughs> what, what else? What else was there? There's the biology lesson. There's the books. I would have just thrown those straight in the bin and gone, <laughs> mum, dad, I've cracked it now. Leave me alone. What, what I do want to know is from a young age, you've obviously you played the game, but when you got to, to your first cap, did you feel like you'd arrived or did you think, geez, this is another step. This is another gear. Like I've got to get better. Um, yeah, definitely. I remember because through under 18s, I could dummy and go and go through, I'd be one of the tallest girls on the pitch, so could kind of get away with, not that I hadn't gymmed, but I was young. So my training age was very young and I was very slight. And um, and I could kind of just dummy, go through, run, and I tried it once and I have never been hit so hard. So for me, I, I was like, I, okay, I need to maybe gym a bit more. There was definitely, definitely a step up. Everyone, everyone knew what was going on, not just, myself and maybe one other person, which it's normally normally has been in the past. Everyone knew what was going on. You've got to be mentally switched on as well as physically as well. Um, so yeah, I did I did feel ready and I felt like it's the best thing because it kind of almost dropped me in the deep end and allowed me to to get better and have to try get better as quick as possible. Um, and I was supported by a lot of the girls at the time anyway to make that. And I made mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes in my first few games. I got yellow carded, said to the refs, I didn't go off and everyone was looking at me. And I said, well, what now? And he said, get off, get off the pitch. And I thought I was, I was expecting another yellow because you don't really get yellow carded in club rugby at under 18s. So when I got, yeah, yellow card, I was like, okay, cool. And I was like, yeah, what should I do? And he said, get off the pitch. And there was another where um, I kind of caught the ball and I so I hadn't played fullback before playing for um, England. And when I got the call, the call up, they said, oh, Ellie, we know you play fullback. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> sounds good. And they said, oh, we want you to come play. So I was like, oh, brilliant. And when I first touched the ball, my first touch, all I thought was, what do fullbacks do? And so I booted it and I tried to boot it as hard as I could. And it went straight out into touch. 
and I'd never boot it. I always run. I'm a runner, and I've just boot it in search. And when you watch the clips back, that someone, one of the commentators is singing my praise, a young player, blah, 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 hopefully in the steps of Emily Scarrett. And Emily Scarrett's on the um, commentator as well, and she goes, oh, not sure if I'd do that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of lessons, and I'm, I'm still, I'm still making errors and learning from them because I've still got a lot of years ahead, ahead of me. Um, but yeah, learn, learn as I go, and it's maybe the, the tough way, but it's also good that we can come into camp each week. Now, I'll, I'll tell you now that experience is the best teacher. You need to make mistakes to, to learn from them. Um, you can talk about scenarios all you like, and you can talk, you know, train, but you need to do them in games. Yeah. And I'm um, just picking up on your yellow card thing. I think I got my first yellow card when I was 10 years old. So uh, I beat you to that one. Um, slightly, maybe maybe that's different in boys and men's rugby. I don't know. You said you'd never seen a yellow before that. I just always stood out on the wing. That's all. I didn't get involved. There was always fights in, in boys rugby. And I'd stand out on the wing looking at all of them thinking, well, I'm not getting involved with that. <laughs> um, what about like the you know senior players experience? You, you talk about like making mistakes, learning on the hoof. How important was someone like Nolly, um, Danielle Waterman, in those for you in those early years? Uh, yeah, massively. I, I was coming into a position I, I had little experience in, and she was really good at any question I had, even just coming up to me and talking to me about on-field stuff and off-field stuff was really, really helpful. There was a lot of positioning things I had to get right, the whole pendulum, like all the, the, the actual stuff that you need to know in the detail. I had to learn very quickly. Um, and Can I just say for our listeners that don't know what the pendulum is, I'm going to put my, my rugby credentials on the line here and say, I think it's the back threes kind of cover defence system, right? It is. Yes. Yeah. Making it sure sweeps like a pendulum. Yeah. Okay, um, carry so on. She kind of um, just helped me, helped me out with all that um, and just made sure that I was in line. There was a, a couple of games she played against France and she was on the wing and I was at fullback. So when you come back to the pendulum, you can both be in the backfield together. So we were like two fullbacks at that point. So, yeah. Harriet, what about you? Just, I'm going to come back to your early memories in a second, but the importance of being, do you, you must see yourself as a senior player. Do, do you feel you, you have to, you're turning 30 tomorrow. You're now a senior, senior player. Um, <laughs> but do you feel... Um, an importance to share your experience and your knowledge with with younger players I think if they ask for it then I would I wouldn't just start like um I'm definitely one of the older ones now like my chats with Ellie aren't aren't doing like TikTok videos my chat is like how are you feeling no <laughs> it's not like the fun chat or like well in Scotland, um, they all like did a little performance for us, and it was like the old girls that were just sat back with a cup of tea, watching, pretending we were going to get involved. I know I was involved. We said so. We were all sat around, and we said, oh, "Let's play karaoke. Let's play karaoke. Let's do do some karaoke." And then I, I sat there and I was like, "So it would be a really good idea. Why don't we just perform to each other?" So we did like young youngies and oldies, and we spent ages choreographing a full dance. We're singing a song that was going into a different song, like a mashup. Came back in thinking that they were doing the same, and they just watched us and like, "Oh, well done!" And we were like, "Oh, did you not do it either?" <laughs> the oldies, eh? The oldies. Yeah. But like, in, in terms of your training presence, your training ethic, how you operate on and off the field, knowing to relax and have three puddings a day, let your hair down like that. But also, when you cross the white line or go into the turf or the gym at Penny Hill or go onto the field you know, the responsibility of a senior player to set the example. Do you consciously think about that or do you just go and do? I just go and do, but I think I'm a lot more chilled out now than when I first started and that probably comes through. So if I have a bad training session, I used to spend hours thinking about it and going over footage being like, oh my God, I can't believe I made that pass, things like that. Whereas now I just bin it and then still watch the footage back but just the process of it isn't it doesn't sit on you as heavily in terms of making a mistake and things like that and then I, I don't know I'm a, I feel like I'm quite chilled out at training unless it's really late at wasps on a Tuesday night then I'm not so great <laughs> then I'm a little bit negative because I'm tired I have to take a different role at club to here here I can be a lot more chilled out and I just step up when I have to whereas at club I think I think it's different yeah, it's a diff totally different environment. Whereas uh, here I know my stuff, 
And then if they need someone to speak, I can. Whereas there's other people, there's like uh, Zoe, Sunter, that I don't know, they're tactical and things like that. And if it came to it, I'd be able to know it, but I don't feel like I need to impose myself until. It's shared out a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's the duty of an international player, right? So when, when you're on international yeah. duty, there's, there's 23, 30 of you. You yeah. all know the standard. You, you're the best of the best. But when you go back to club, you're then a role model, almost a beacon. You, you've got to you've got to take on extra workload. You've got to set the example and, and show people how it's done. Right. I, I want to know about your early memories from 2011 when you first got capped because it must be completely different. We're, we're 10 years on now. Um, go, throw your mind back. Um, so, um, for a start, I um, remember getting the call up and it was a really awkward call up because I'd been to... Um, I'd been, I'd, I'd basically rolled my ankle the weekend before on a night out. I basically <laughs> tripped over an invisible skipping rope. I remember crawling off the dance floor being like, I think there's something wrong. Um, and my ankle was huge. Like, do you know when you see like people with ankle problems where they're, they're fat on their ankles is like turned over their shoe. It was like, it was huge. My ankle like just more, ballooned. Like all swollen, yeah. Yeah absolutely huge um and then I got the call on so that was the weekend and then I got the call on the Tuesday from Graeme Smith being like hey uh, I'd like you to come and I was like hey so uh, I got an issue um and he was like I know you'll be fit for the game I was like okay yeah I will be <laughs> um so I we went to France and this is how old it was they watered the pitch um, so there's this photo of somebody pulling um, Sarah Hunter out of a puddle and she was literally fit head first in a puddle that was like her whole head would have fitted in it. So we were meant to, that was in like a warm up game, the Wednesday before the game on the Saturday. They watered the entire pitch and Jam Man, our team manager, who is an absolute hero, basically was like, our girls aren't playing on this pitch, so find us another pitch. Um and she, I think she was bluffing, but I feel like she was set to walk away from the game. So we ended up playing in a cage, do you know, like um, like a basketball cage, but obviously around a rugby pitch. Yeah, so like a no football, space. I think they're like football stadiums, aren't they? Because football yeah. fans are great, passionate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but there was we're literally gonna keep, no... We're going to have a cage to keep them off the field. Yeah, essentially, but it was a rugby pitch. Um, so yeah, I was on the bench. Um, so we, we, we played the game. I uh, came on with about 20 minutes to go and I came on and Tam, I came on at a line out and Tamara Taylor just turned to me and apologised and said, the ball's coming to you. I'm sorry. I was like, okay. Um, so yeah. And then I caught it. That was the important part. Caught that the line it. out. So Graham yeah. Smith was happy. Graham Smith was my first coach uh, at England under 18s and Worcester <laughs> Academy. A great man. Very, yeah, very great. nice man. And he um, turned to me at the end, at the end of the game and said, I'll make um you'll make an England player one day. And I cried because I thought it was a negative. I thought <laughs> I thought he was insulting me. And then like after one of the other girls was like, Has that was a compliment? Like oh. I was like, oh, okay. I thought he was being like, you were awful. Uh Harriet, I can't talk to you without touching on injury, um, mm. which disrupted um your journey after Belfast um and your amazing comeback. To international rugby how long were you out was it 20 um, 22 yeah, months yeah just under two years but you went on to have three knee surgeries right yeah it kind of was like an unraveling of bad events we rushed through choosing a surgeon and everything like that um so then um the acl graft um went again in the so that was in the december i got my op two months later end of december just before christmas um, and then I was back and up until June. So I was back running, back training, just like individual skills, things like that. So I was getting back quite quick. But um, and then I went, I was running and picked up a loose ball. And as I went down for the loose ball, I just felt my knee like basically it ricocheted in then out. So I felt it was weird. I felt the, like the MCL go, then the LCL go. And then like the final pop. And I was like, yeah, I've done it again. How did you stay positive? And like, what, what motivated you during that time? Because it's a bloody long time to, yeah. to be out injured. Um, so how I stayed positive was when I did it, Rick, the physio, England physio at the time, was like, I think you should go on holiday before your next stop. 
So I planned a road trip down the uh, west coast of America and I went away for three weeks. I went to Vegas, went to yeah, Yosemite, went to um, LA, went to San Fran. What was your favourite place? Um, oh, hard. Yosemite and Bass Lake were stunning. Um, but Vegas, like, that is a one, like, that was just insane. And it's so, like a whole different world. So you're saying basically some time away to just um because it's all consuming when you're when you're in rehab and injury yeah. like you're in the same gym every day change your scenery bit of d on the face you're yeah. saying getting away was was good for you yeah definitely and he just literally like um rick just sat me down and was like it's gonna be a long 18 months you need to go sort your stuff out so um yeah i went away for three and a half weeks came back um and then giselle uh made the um Ellie, you'll understand this conversation. Um, if you have, if anybody ever knows Giselle, she's the most incredible woman, incredible coach. But the day after my operation, my second op, I was drugged up to the max and she rang me and was like, uh, hey, has so we don't have a coach, a forwards coach for the development side. Uh, I think you'd be really good at it. Um, <laughs> I was like so drugged up. I was like, oh, can I think about it? She was like, yeah, well, you know, it can just be a few weekends. You don't need to come to coach training or anything. Just, you know, uh, just help out, um, help out the club. And then every time you come down, you can have physio as well. Um, I was booked in with a full staff kit first weekend of the season. And then was every week was like the coach. That, that definitely kept me in rugby. When my knee went, I rang my dad and was like, I'm not doing this. I in my dad just was like oh well just you know carry on until you get back fit and then see don't don't quit now are you happy with what you've been through like the the, the resilience that you've learned and um the kind of mental fortitude that you've probably gained from, from your injury yeah I'm um I used to think I didn't know what I was doing I was just playing what I saw whereas actually coaching made me realize I actually know I know a lot more than um I thought I knew I just didn't voice it. Um, so I think that helped me with like just confidence of just knowing that I know what was going on. Um, and yeah, like I probably would have like, it's it's a long career, isn't it? Well, if I'd been playing the entire time, would I still love the game? You don't know. So I just take it that I basically had two years out and came back. Nice. Good. Yeah. Um, Ellie, I'm kind of conscious you've been sat down there. I saw your eyes rolling at one point. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm looking at my water. I keep thinking, can I have some water? Of course or you can. Have a drink, Ellie, because I'm about to talk to you. After reading about you, Ellie, um, you, you've had a few knocks. One of the things you did struggle with, right, is injury when you first went over to sevens. And you alluded to it earlier, saying physically you weren't as developed. Um, and you probably weren't ready. Uh, you talked about like gymming, conditioning, that sort of stuff. Can you talk us through yours? Yeah, it's, if I'm honest, still still going a little bit. Whenever I've gone to physio, that's that's always been the bottom line. Your body needs to be stronger than you in the development phase of being an athlete. You know, you're more robust so that your body can kind of handle the the stress of playing. And like I said, being physically ready to not just be hit by by strong women and but also to keep up to the training load. I've played with people just like you, and this is credit to you, you're an athlete. Finely, finely tuned athletes. Like, I never got, like, stress injuries, you know. I never pulled a muscle because I wasn't quick enough and I hardly had any muscles. What, what happens when you're fast and quick and agile and, and powerful? You, you're highly, you know, finely tuned. You've got to be careful. But um, do you understand like at 21 years old, that any sport that you play, there's going to be injury and setback, right? Yeah, I think the, them experiences have allowed me to understand that. I hadn't understood that before. And the first time that I was out with my shins for a set period of time, I found it really difficult to get my head around because I, it got to the point where I'd have live GPS on and GPS is obviously, as you know, you it's tracking your metres and I was always on a max amount of metres. So I'd go into training and I'd be like, okay, I feel fine. And I'm past my injury, but they say, okay, well, you've only got X amount of metres today, so we'll pull you out when you're ready. And I remember one time I hadn't touched the ball that much or not in the way that I wanted to. And I was finally ready. And I was like, yes, I'm in the perfect position. And they were like, Ellie, out. And I was like, just one more, just one more. And just, no, out, come on, now. And they'd have a, a like a little deck chair because I used to stand next to the, the pitch. Dude. Never sit down at training. Like you get no. so much jip. 
Yeah, well, that's thing. So I used to stand on the side of the pitch doing keepy uppies. And they're like, that's not, you might as well be playing rugby if you're going to be doing keepy uppies. Sit down on the chair. So I'd have to sit like a, like a little kid. Um, so that, type, that kind of thing also taught me to work. Um, I was, I've been g- gifted with um, playing and, uh, in under 18s and then representing my country without being under 20s. And I wouldn't say I've had it easy by any stretch. But my pathway has been quite clear, um, without any bumps, without any you haven't you haven't been selected for this or whatever, and that injury really let me like actually realise that there is a lot of work that needs to be done, and mentally there's a lot of um, strength needed um, to get through the, the injuries because they do happen, they happen all the time. I I got a knock the other week in, on my shoulder and. In the past couple of weeks, I've been well through the Six Nations, been struggling with a little, with it a little bit. But then you start learning to shake something off, knowing the difference between what hurts and what's an injury, and getting through it almost. Ladies, how, how hard has it been to deal with all the postponements and restructuring over the last twelve months, uh, Harriet? Especially for you, um, you've had to deal with it with with the schoolwork as well. Schoolwork. You're not a student. You're a teacher. But in terms of, has it been difficult um luckily my school is super super supportive so um I just went in and said can I keep working please and they're like yeah sure they're really really good as long as I don't mess them around so I only I'm part-time so as long as I give them as much a uh, warning as possible that I'm going to miss a day but COVID's actually helped it's proven that you can teach from home so um so tomorrow because we're still in isolation tomorrow I'm going to teach uh, virtually so uh, one of the TAs will just put me up on the screen and then I'll teach that way um, so it's quite good that and then I work uh, I speak to mids a lot and basically just work it around I get the schedule and then I work my lessons around that and if I can't attend any then I'll just put work online but luckily um, he knows what time I'm working so he like will just like say to, the, to go to the gym I'll just go I'll just do the gym session an hour later then everyone else so that I can teach. I think it's better for the game to be postponed um, in terms of like uh, other countries. We've been really lucky that our league's gone ahead this year. So we've been playing rugby all year. There's some countries that haven't played rugby all year. That's not great for like, just imagine if you're like a spectator watching that and the rugby's not as good as it could be. Um, it's not going to improve the game. Like, the overall participation that like, will be good for will be in a positive place because we've played rugby all year but the other teams won't have them realistically we want to win because we're the best not because we've had an advantage of playing rugby yeah and and Ali for, for you do you think as a as an athlete you're kind of set up to be adaptable um obviously the 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 shifting of the six nations and the restructuring of it and the New Zealand being delayed by a year do you think that's played you know, as, as an athlete, are you ready for that? Is it easy to accept that? Um, for me personally, I, I did find it quite hard. I made a really difficult switch from sevens to fifteens because sevens um, wasn't a thing at the time and the Olympics was cancelled. So, so for me, that was the first, oh, now what? And I was able to refocus onto the fifteens and New Zealand. So that was in my head it's okay I, all I want to be is the best athlete I can be and it doesn't matter which competition as long as I'm getting better I've got plenty ahead of me so then refocused on to New Zealand and then when that when the announcement that the Olympics was coming back with a year later I was super happy I was like I'm, I know what I'm focusing on and the girls are doing the Olympics and I'm really happy for them it hit me a few days later because it was kind of uh, it would mean that I've been training since I was 18 full time for a competition that just keeps getting moved a year on. Um, so I did find it difficult in that respect, um, but it has made me super adaptable. Uh, I am blessed with my age and I have got a lot of years ahead of me. Um, and that the fact that we have Six Nations definitely helps as well. Um, and we have full-time training and you, we're still able to play for Wasps each weekend. And the Prem is so competitive at the moment that it's never really a walkover. You don't know anymore who's going to win. Um, so there's still that competitive aspect and being able to flip it on its head when, I've, when we, we have all this time in the hotel rooms on our own to 
actually see it as a, a, a chance to develop. And like Harriet was saying, the other teams are going to be needing to train so that the competition is good. But we have got so much potential. Time is not going to be like bad for us. We're just going to get better and better. We'll get a few more games in, in the bag next year with another Six Nations and we'll be in a better place come next year to to have a good shot at, at the um, in New Zealand. I, I, I love that because I knew, I kind of knew the answer with, without asking it, but I was going to say, is, is time your friend here? Like you guys are good to go if you were playing in the, you know, if the tournament was tomorrow or next week, you guys would be good to go. But I love the sort of attitude you've got basically a year to grow as a team. Um, AP 15s is obviously the standards only getting better. So it's driving competition for places. So, um, geez, are you a bit nervous in a year's time? You know, there might be a new kid on the block pushing you guys out. Like you got to be, you have to stay at the top of your game. You know what I mean? Maybe, but it, that can only make us better. It's good. Competition is good and pressure is such a privilege because not a lot of people got it. If you don't have pressure, then you're probably doing it for the wrong reason. Geez, you're good. You're good. <laughs> She's good. She smashed it, didn't she? That uh, that's not even, I don't even think that's media. I don't think that's media training. I just think you're a, a competitive beast. Yeah, but you've got to be competitive. I think mean, all the sevens girls coming back into the league as well just increased. Well, that's an influx of at least 15 players that are starting players. Yeah, yeah, international players across the board. And that just, and you notice the difference now, even in camp that they've all gone out to GB and like just, you we, we've all improved. Like I can't, I don't know anyone who's not got so much better just in the last nine months from the influx of players. Yeah. So even next year will be getting better. I asked uh, Ellie about Harriet at the start, about making things awkward. Uh, Harriet, I want to know about uh, Ellie's Instagram handle. Lukewarm is no good. Um, do, do you know anything about that? <laughs> no, but my mind's gone places. <laughs> um, no, I don't know. Ali, could you give us the quote, please? Do you yeah, know the quote? Yeah, off by, off by heart, I'm not too sure. It's basically saying if if you, let me find it, if you're passionate about something, you've got to go at full throttle. I began to realise how important it was to be an enthusiast in life. If you're interested in something, no matter what it is, go at it full speed, embrace it with both arms, hug it, love it, and above all, become passionate about it. Lukewarm is no good. Love That's that. Cute. That's cute. That's really cute. Yeah. Harriet? Lukewarm is no good. I feel like uh, on the rugby pitch, that is Ellie all over. She's like 100% in. The gym, you have to like drag her. You're like, come on, Elle. Like, just pick up that five kilos and do a bicep curl. <laughs> <laughs> but on the pitch, like training and everything, you're literally like, well, why, why am I going to do it if I'm not going to do it the best? Um, attitude. Whereas, um, yeah, on the, like, you're 100% like when with rugby. Is, is Ellie, is that your motto for life? Because um, yeah. it sounds like you do need to apply it to the gym. Um, yeah, definitely. Of course, it is. Motto. You won't get anything from lukewarm because you might be like this constant and you might feel all right and a bit comfortable. But until you turn the pressure up, that's when, that's when it gets, you actually see a change. And nothing changes if nothing changes. So whether that be on the pitch and everything's all right, but... If we carry on the way we're doing, we're just going to do another phase, another phase, another phase, another phase. Someone's got to do something that's hot. And it might be a line break, it might be a massive hit, but that's when something will will change. Um, and it's it's the same off the pitch. Whatever you're doing, I just believe that if, you, if you're going to do something, you're going to put the time into doing it, actually make sure it's good. Actually make sure that whatever you're going to do, you are going to have the outcome that you that you want. Um so yeah, I kind of try to apply it. Yes, I know the in terms of the gym, it's a running joke. Just to be clear, it's a joke. It's a running joke that I don't enjoy the gym. I wouldn't say that I love love going to the gym all the time. I like playing and I like scoring and I like playing rugby. The gym's obviously that comes with it, but I'm I'm not a rugby player to be in the gym. I'm a rugby player for playing on the pitch and you, I've just got to think it's going to make me stronger, it's going to make me faster, it's going to keep me from being injured, it's going to make me a better player and then just get my head down and, and go. But if I could if I could play rugby all day, every day and and get the strength by just playing that rather than going to the gym, of course I'd say that and I think quite a few other people would say that as well. But they won't actually yeah, say it on a podcast going on in the <laughs> rugby or anything. No, I'll openly admit I hate the gym. 
I just got I just got injured for two years and had to live in it. So I guess okay. can I can I give you guys some some sound philosophical advice? Start telling yourselves you like the gym because if it, the, the more you tell yourself you don't like something, you put negative connotations. You're going to sigh and moan every time you're going to walk up those stairs at Penny Hill. Like just just flick the switch. Start telling yourself it, it's work. I'm going in. It's just like social media, you're just going into Instagram to do the job, do the post, get off. Don't spend two hours on there. You know, scrolling. We used to say, we used to say when we were playing with sevens and so when we went to um, Australia last year, it was 47 degrees Celsius. And it started the fires again when we were out there. Uh, honestly, you'd walk outside and it'd hit you. Um, and we made it a rule that you wasn't allowed to say, oh, I'm so hot. You weren't, that was a, a no go. If anybody said, oh, I'm so hot, you, I mean, you'd get a mouthful. It's the same as when people say, I'm so tired. They're not tired. It's just a really easy thing to say when there's a bit of silence. You go, oh, I'm so tired, but you're not tired. <laughs> you're just a bit awkward and you feel like you just need to complain about something. <laughs> um, it's one, one thing I learned really early, especially as a, a, a senior player, especially as a captain. You're never tired, you're never cold, you're never hungry. Like, because as soon as you say it, so many people look yeah. to you and it's like, oh, I'm tired too, I'm cold. And it's a bit wet and it just, it can spread like wildfire. I just want to say for 21 years old, you're like a, a wise old owl. And you know what? When it's delivered in a, a Northern accent, it just sounds so much better. When you're talking about like lukewarm, basically um, comfort is the enemy of progression and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's great to hear. I've got something we're going to play called The Greatest. Uh, it's a quick fire quiz. Um, it's The Greatest. I'm going to ask you what your greatest so-and-so is. Ellie, where has been the greatest place you've played the game? Sevens uh, or fifteens? Sevens, we travelled to some really nice places. I really liked Vancouver. We had to fly over in a, a mini aeroplane. And it, I, at that point, decided that's where I'm probably going to get married or retire and go to. Um, pitch wasn't as nice because it was a 4G pitch and we came away with scuffs and, and bruises and cuts and what have you. Are we talking like water plane? like forest landing on a lake rugby pitch in the mountains or like can you paint a picture quickly so we flew over in a big in a big plane from obviously england to canada and then uh, i think it was either langford or vancouver i always get mixed up and then we got into a, almost like a water plane and we there was only the rugby team in there and we flew over and it was lakes and you'd look to your side and there'd be a um, mountain but you were in line with it and you'd look down and there was someone's house at opened up to the lake and we didn't quite land on the water but we weren't too far away and um it was just amazing and on our off off day we found some open water springs went away from all the coaches and everyone and we took a barbecue and we just all jumping in the in the water off the sides and it was just really awesome a really 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 nice place warm weather which helps but um Brilliant. just a, a really sweet spot Sorry, that's supposed to be quick fire. It's my fault for asking more. No, you're fine. Uh, I look anyway. <laughs> Harriet, what is the greatest way to wind down after a hard training session? It would literally be my pyjamas, slippers and a cup of tea. But again, would be my pyjamas, slippers and gin. <laughs> I've, just, I've just clicked. I don't think any of the men's team take pyjamas to camp. Oh. <laughs> do, do, you, do you take pyjamas? Like, because I know how reliant my wife is on her dress, like her robe or a dressing gown and her pajamas. She's got like five different sets of pajamas. I just don't get it. It's comfort. It's comfort when you don't want to be in care all the time, and you want to. I, I mean, I used to bring candles, so it felt a bit like. <laughs> That's next <Yeah>. level. <laughs> um, got like pajamas matched with slippers, set. You know. Oh my goodness! I've heard it all. Um, Ellie, who out of the squad would be the greatest on I'm a Celeb? Oh, um, probably I'd say Hannah Bottoman. Her and Brian, uh, not her and Brian, her and Poppy um, did some bits in the first lockdown or summer last year when they, they were eating some funky stuff. So I don't think, I think they, they're semi-prepared for that type of thing. And she's, she's a tough, tough nut, so she'd, um, she'd, she'd be all right. Okay, box is going in then. Harriet, it's your birthday tomorrow. Who is going to make your birthday cake or who would you want to make your birthday cake? Who's the oh, best baker? I say Lark. And she's artistic, so she'd make it look good. Noted. Yeah. Um, does she ever deliver uh, for, for girls in camp? 
Yeah, she made brownies today. She made brownies today and because it's been uh, Frito's birthday and Zoe Harrison's and came up to me and apologised. And she was like, I thought I made them dairy free, but I didn't. So sorry, you've not got any. <laughs> Happy like, oh. birthday! <laughs> she, yeah. she bought me a tub of Biscoff instead. Do you know the Biscoff spread? Yeah, I had a Biscoff. Bread. Oh my gosh, I had a Biscoff cookie the other day. That's like oh. an untapped resource. They need to be mining that. <laughs> Ellie, what is the greatest prank you've ever seen? Off the top of my head, I remember um, in my first when we went to France. Obviously, it's a big game a few years ago, and I was a, an eighteen-year-old, and I told the manager that I'd left my passport in the airport. And she tried to stay really calm because it was, I think it was just before the game or just after the game. And she was like, okay, um, don't worry about it. And I was, I was, you know, when you're shaking, trying not to laugh because I could see all the girls looking at me. And they told me I had to do it because I, I was the youngest. Um, basically, you had a lion. If you're the youngest in the team, you've got a little mascot. And um, if the lion gets stolen off you, you've got to do a forfeit. And that was my forfeit. And I mean, I got a bit of a... a a slap on the arm after but yeah it was it was funny to see your face drop but also think oh bless you okay we're gonna don't worry about it and you could see a brain being like oh god what we're gonna do oh, wait you don't you never mess with team managers the fragile never, people never again <laughs> what is uh hypotenuse Hypo hypotenuse is that how i say it yeah that's how you say it ellie you answering no uh, Harriet, you are oh okay it's the line like the biggest line on the triangle or the one that's opposite the 90 degree angle or the, the right technical angle. answer is the longest side of a right angle triangle i'm glad you answered that because i was going to say something way different to that okay <laughs> you're lucky ellie we're coming back to you what is pi to three decimal places 3.14392 3 <laughs> i have no idea you were so close go again 3.145. 146. Teacher, does she pass? No, is it three? I don't think you pass. Why? No, you didn't. I don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> is it 3.1427? 3, 3. No. 3.142 3. will do. 142. Okay. Um, <laughs> last one to our maths teacher, Harriet. What is the formula to find the area of a circle? I squared. Yes, Bigger. correct. You still know. got a job. I know. Ooh. You do learn that in your eight when you're like, what, 13, 14 years old? <laughs> I'd right. be worried if I got that one wrong. I don't know. Right, Ellie, Harriet, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for your insights yeah. and your honesty. Uh, good luck for next week, finals time. Thank you.